had told Avery's friend we'd come by and get her this morning. We're like, oh, we've got to get Aaliyah. Uh, and uh, so I ran by, to, ran by with the girls to get Aaliyah and uh, divide and conquer kind of morning. But we're here. All right, let's go ahead and get into our uh, prayer requests. We, uh, we have a prayer request from Elizabeth Smith. So you know Elizabeth and Will Smith. Um, so Elizabeth asked prayers for her grandpa, Mike Bashaw. Um, as he recovers from a fall. So I went and visited with Mike on uh, Thursday, and, uh, and he was uh, at a rehab facility in Arlington. They've moved here from California. Uh, you might remember, toward the end of last year, um, Elizabeth's grandmother, Jeanette, so Jeanette and Mike Bashaw, uh, Jeanette uh, came and um, visited uh, with, with Elizabeth, um, but they, they moved here so that um, so Elizabeth could help with, with some of the, the care for Mike, uh, both of them. And, uh, but but uh, Mike could use our prayers. He actually wound up um, having a fall on Thursday. Um, he had been doing better, but he wound up broken his collarbone. Um, so keep Mike uh, Bashaw in your prayers. Annette Jarvis also requests our prayers uh, for her mom, uh, who is also in rehab for uh, similar reasons. Um, and so a lot of folks, uh, you know, Nancy Giles, of course, uh, just got out of, of uh, rehab. Um, someone else uh, who's not coming to mind right now. Uh, it will come to me. Uh, but then also, uh, Charlene Nelson, I think most of you know Charlene. She's been uh, visiting with us for quite a while and helping out with different things. Um, she texted this morning. She's not going to be able to make it in person, and she would just appreciate our prayers. She's not feeling well this morning, and so she asked if we would pray for her. Anything else? Oh, hey, Sam. Still looking for a job, yep. Sam, in good news, you know, I think you know that uh, Trevor, who was also on the job hunt with you, has found a job. So that's good. He'll start next week. Anything else? All right. I, we'll pray for the, uh, the parents of the newborn back there, too, James and Catherine, and their sleepless nights, I imagine. Uh, by, by Timothy's in the nursery. He's, you didn't let him drive to church today? Oh, he's right there. Oh, there he is. Okay. All right. Oh, he's so small. He just hides, just, just hides back there. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we're thankful for today. We're thankful for the blessings that you give us. So we're thankful for our health. We ask that you would, uh, you would watch over us uh, as we uh, continue on this morning, too. And uh, as we uh, focus in our minds on the word and worship. We, uh, we ask that you would bless our study today, you would bless our time of worship as we sing and pray together as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Father, we are mindful of those who are experiencing difficulties, and, and many who have relatives and family members who are uh, experiencing difficulty that they are, are caring for. And we ask that you would be with uh, Mike Bashaw, grandfather of, of Elizabeth, uh, and uh, be with him after this latest uh, fall, that he would uh, be able to continue recovering. We we'll ask that you would also be with Annette Jarvis's mom as she uh, continues to in rehab uh, to, to help with the difficulties that she's having. We, uh, we ask that you'd be with our sister Charlene as she has uh, uh, woken up not feeling well today. And we ask that you would bless her with a, a quick return to health. And we ask that you'd be with Sam as he continues on the job hunt that something would, uh, would open up, a door would open up, uh, a good opportunity for, for his next step in, in work. Thankful, too, to have James and Catherine with us, and Timothy, and we ask you to bless them, bless Michael, uh, bless your young family, um, but, uh, but we uh, ask that you would give them uh, patience and endurance and, and, uh, and, and some good rest along the way in uh, the early months of, of childhood. <clears throat> We're just thankful for the opportunities you give us as a congregation. I ask that you would watch over us. You would help us to, uh, to, to do the best that we can with every opportunity that you give us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, just a handful of announcements. Um, we do have our annual service uh, project uh, happening with uh, Academy Ford. It's coming up very quickly on April 12th, um, so two Fridays away. Um, and so that uh, the annual project, you might remember if you participate with us in Academy Ford, is we put together um, shelf-stable item bags with our, our students. And so we'll pull some items from the pantry, but we'll also, um, you know, ask that you think about uh, adding some items to that. 
And so out on the Welcome Center is a list, and I've just kind of divided it out into different categories of things that we need. And so if you'd like to provide that, just put your name by one, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get that divvied out. Or if you just want to give some cash, I'll take cash. I'll put it in the church pocket right there. Um, I always, let's always stick things right there because I know it's not mine. Um, but um, but we'll, we'll make sure that those things get purchased. We're, we did that last year, and it went over pretty well. Um, we also, uh, let's see here, today is a fifth Sunday. I know it's also Easter Sunday, but uh, it's a fifth Sunday. Um, and so we're following that fifth Sunday schedule. And so we are going to have a potluck uh, after worship if you'd like to stay. We know folks may have other plans. Um, but, uh, but it sounds like there's a pretty good number that are going to stay too. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, that will be right after our morning worship. And of course, we always invite our, our guests and those who are uh, mobility challenged to go to the front of the line. And, uh, and then uh, we will not have a 5 p.m. service tonight. So just be aware of that. Let's see here. Um, Doug, did you happen to get my uh, email about the presentation for class this morning? There we go. Look at that. He did. All right. Good. So we're going to have that up for a little while, Doug, just so you know. I know you kind of work on some other things on, during Bible class. Um, but, but maybe about 10 minutes that we'll use this and a few other slides, if you don't mind staying with me. Uh, I assume these aren't working right now. All right. So we are into the book of 1 Corinthians today. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we will spend this week and next week uh, in 1 Corinthians. I'm, uh, you know, we, we just studied 1 Corinthians Sunday evenings uh, all last year almost. And uh, so I don't feel like we need to spend too much time there, but we are making our way systematically every two weeks through a new book of the New Testament this, this Sunday morning, these Sunday mornings of this year. Um, the key verse, two of the key verses uh, for, for this text, for this book, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, that we're going to be talking about in the sermon this morning, and then 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13, uh, which we'll be talking about in the sermon next Sunday. So we'll focus on the two key verses, key texts in this letter uh, in our sermons. But keeping uh, on track with our, our themes for the New Testament books, if you've been keeping track of this, we've got uh, Matthew, of course, Jesus the King. Uh, excuse me, Jesus, uh, yeah, Jesus the King. I looked at the wrong thing. I'll just go by memory, it's better. Um, we've got uh, Mark, Jesus the Servant. We've also got Luke, Jesus the Man. We've got John, Jesus, the Son of God. I don't think we talked about Acts or Romans. I, I kind of forgot to mention those, but Acts, you could just say the church, all right? And the book of Romans, you could say righteousness revealed, righteousness revealed for the book of Romans. So for 1 Corinthians, uh, we get the two-word theme of church problems, church problems. So... How did we get to uh, 1 Corinthians? Well, let's run through it real quick. We've got this map of Paul's journeys up there. I know that you can all see that so well from where you're sitting. Uh, those little lines just kind of blend in, but uh, we've got different lines for the different journeys. Of course, you know that Paul wound up in Corinth on his second uh, missionary uh, journey. Uh, you'll recall after the first journey, they returned home. Let me see if I have the dates written down here. I don't. Um, let's see, I do. 46 to 48 AD is the rough time period for that first missionary journey. Then 50 AD comes around, and Paul and Barnabas uh, want to go and return to these places and revisit and encourage the saints at those various uh, stops that they made along the way. But you'll remember on the first journey, uh, Mark left. Right, got to Perga, and Mark uh, left. And so when Barnabas wanted to take Mark again on the second journey, there was a, a bitter dispute, right? And so Barnabas and Paul part ways. So Barnabas and Mark go on about their journey, and we don't really uh, hear from Barnabas much at all again. We see Mark a few more times in the New Testament. Uh, and then Paul... Uh, picks up uh, Silas, and they go north, as you can kind of see up the side of the map there, kind of that, that uh, purplish line, I think it is. Uh, they go up to Tarsus, where Paul is from. 
Uh, this time they're going back through Lystra, where you remember Lystra is where Paul had been uh, stoned and left for dead on that first missionary journey. On this one, the second trip, things are much more positive. Um, so they, that is where they meet a young man named Timothy. And so, of course, his mother and grandmother had a great influence on Timothy. And so Timothy actually joins up with Paul and Silas. They continue on the journey until their way is blocked. They are told not to go any further, so they turn to the north. They eventually wind up in Troas, where they meet Luke, and so Luke joins them, and, and as we read in the book of Acts, you can see the difference between um, pronouns like, like we and us, and you and them, uh, and so when it's we and us, Luke is with them, and when it's the other, other uh, terms, uh, Luke is not. But um, we know that as they're continuing on in their journey, some troublesome Jews from Thessalonica show up in Berea, stir up the people. Luke, Timothy, and Silas need to get Paul out of town in the middle of the night. And so they put him in a boat bound for Athens. And they stay behind to finish up the work. Um, Paul is in Athens for a little while. Remember that he had the opportunity to speak in the Areopagus. Uh, but despite this uh, good opportunity, uh, the success of the gospel in that area seems to be limited. And so Paul then arrives in Corinth probably toward the middle of 50 A.D. And so you can see there on that map that Corinth is a narrow uh, isthmus of land there. Doug, if you'll go to the next map for me. There we go. Thank you, sir. So a little bit better view there of where Corinth is on that narrow uh, isthmus of land. And so all trade, almost all trade, uh, that went to and from Rome came through that narrow passageway. It uh, came through that narrow passageway because going down and around was so much more dangerous, right? And so this was a way to, to limit danger, to limit exposure. And so you might think, well, how did they do that? And we'll look at the next photo. And that is the early track system that they had. From the 6th century B.C., they used a track system. It was stone with grooves. It's kind of like a, like a reverse railway, right? It's pretty ingenious. You know, when we think about all the things that were done in history and how did they build the pyramids, how did they do all these different things, there was a lot of engineering. A lot of that engineering and knowledge was lost along the way in some of these great fires and different things. Um, but, you know, we have something like this. Let me see what the name of it is again. I remember it starts with a D. I think it's like Diolcus, D-I-O-L-K-O-S. So as far as 600 B.C., uh, this system, this roadway had been used. But today, uh, and really for the last hundred years, if you go to Corinth, you would see something more like this. I believe this is the largest cruise ship that ever passed through the Corinthian Canal. But in 18, let's see here, I got it written down, 18, da, 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 I didn't write down, I think it's 1893. 1893, this was finished. Now Nero, who we're talking about some too, Nero had the ambition to accomplish this, uh, this canal. But what object, what, ta what problem do you see that would get in the way of Nero there from that photo? What's that? One way in, sure, yeah. Do you, does it look rocky? That's solid rock. And so Nero wouldn't have had the blasting technology, even with the number of slaves that he had, uh, to get through four miles of rock to that depth. So the, the walls on either side are at an 80-degree angle. It's 300 feet deep from, from, uh, from top of ledge to sea level, uh, and it's only 80 feet across. And the deepest that a, a boat can be below, uh, below sea level there is 24 feet. So you have some real limitations. Usually this is just used for pleasure uh, cruises and pleasure craft, not big boats like this. Uh, this boat, if I remember correctly, only had like, like two feet of tolerance on either side. Really tight. Um, but you, you probably can't see from where you are, but there's actually people in the bow. So they had everybody on the boat. 
um, as they went through here, obviously pulled by a tugboat. Um, but that is now, and for the last hundred years or so, that's how trade gets through there, but again, smaller boats. But there are 11,000 boats a year that pass through the Corinth Canal, the four miles of Rock Channel. Doug, flip on to the next one for me. At either end uh, of the, uh, the Corinth Canal, since I think the 1980s, there have been these unique bridges. You can kind of make them out there. They are submersible bridges. Wilson, I, I'm guessing in all your bridge work that you do, you've never seen a submersible bridge. Uh, but, uh, but this one, you know, so they lowered down to the bottom of the canal. And, uh, and folks who have been there, there's a restaurant that's right near one of these bridges. And so you can watch that go down. You know, if there's 11,000 boats coming through every year, you can watch that go down and up. And a lot of times when it comes up, it's got fish on it. Um, and so it's also a big net, I guess. I, I would imagine that somebody has to have the job of going out and picking up the fish and tossing them back in the water uh, before uh, traffic can proceed. But I just thought that was interesting and just some bonus material for you. Doug, what's the next slide? I can't remember. Was that it? Oh, yeah. All right. So the archaeology site of Corinth. So you've got uh, the Agora, the marketplace there um, in Corinth. Um, and this would be where uh, Paul would have met Aquila and Priscilla. You'll remember that at the beginning of the Corinthian letter, or excuse me, when we're in Acts, when we're in Acts, you read about Paul uh, meeting uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and they were tent makers by trade, so they worked with, um, with uh, uh, fabrics uh, in making tents and sails and other things, mostly canvas-type materials. Paul, too, was trained in uh, working uh, as a tent maker, and so they found that. So the, the foreground is the Agora, but up on the hill there, you can kind of see some, some ruins, right? Uh, they say that's where the Temple of Aphrodite was. And so when we think about Corinth, it's important that we picture in our minds the Temple of Aphrodite, too. The Temple of uh, uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of erotic love, um, gives you an idea of the things that went on in Corinth, right? As Paul is talking about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this whole list of things, and such were some of you, realizing the culture that Paul is, is writing that in is worth uh, thinking about, and how this temple to this goddess loomed over everything. And so you can imagine that, that uh, Paul often would refer, refer to it as he was preaching there in the marketplace and at the synagogue. Next slide, Doug. And just a different look of the same area. The ruins of the Agora, a large marketplace, uh, and then up on the, the hill there, up on the top of that, that plateau, uh, the temple site of uh, the temple of, of Aphrodite. All right, let's see here. Oh, yep, one more bonus image, I believe. There it is. There we go. One more bonus image. Just I thought this was interesting as I was kind of reading through my uh, Bible archaeology magazine that came in this, this month. Um, this, well, let me just have you guess. What do you think that is? What do you think it is? A column? That's a good guess. It looks like a column, but not a column. It's actually much, much smaller. A what? Water? water? Yeah, it's, it's the uh, modern-day Stanley Cup of the day. Uh, no, it's not, not in water, though. It's a good guess, too. Getting closer in size, still smaller. All right, give up? As best as archaeologists can figure, that is the oldest tube of lipstick that's ever been found. I was going to say that. Okay, okay. Well, no joking, no joking. They say, so, so they found this, and so you can see the cap there. Uh, you may not be able to see on the, the screen, but it's red, right? Maybe that would have given away if it were a little, little you know, the, the colors were a little bit truer. But there is a powdery substance inside that they believe was used to, uh, you know, could have been used like, like, like what's that, rouge? I don't know my makeup. I don't wear makeup. Um, but, uh, but, but they figure more, more, like, uh, more like lipstick is what they're thinking. Uh, they tested what the substance is, and it's, it's uh, a, you know, there's still the powder in there. And so they believe that is, um, you know, probably what that is. And so that's a, that's a fancy lipstick tube right there. 
But that's just bonus. All right, Doug, I'm done with the overhead if you need to turn it off and, and get back to, to what you're doing up there. All right, so the events of Paul can be in Corinth can be read in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. I know you, you're probably quite aware of that. But Paul, of course, is kicked out of the synagogue. He continues teaching next door in the house of the former ruler of the synagogue. Uh, and so things must have gotten uh, tense or rough because the Lord speaks to Paul in a vision at night in verse 9 saying, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Okay, so let's, let's think about that, because that, when I was reading through and preparing for class, that statement you know, from God to Paul in Acts 18 struck me differently. I've always kind of focused on the, I have many people in this city who are mine, Right? I, I appreciate that knowledge, right? That's kind of where my mind has always gone. The fact that you're in this, this city, the temple of Aphrodite up above, all these different things that permeate the culture, uh, all these people coming in and out with the sea trade. You know, you, you know, I'm sure at some point Paul thought, well, this, this is a lost cause, right? But God says to Paul, I have many in this city who are my people. Right, we've used that to talk about before. Sometimes we feel like we're the only one, we're all alone, or uh, nobody's interested in, in you know, hearing about the gospel anymore, all these different things. Wherever we go, I know that God would tell us the same thing if he spoke to us today like he did to Paul, which he does not, by the way. Um, but we know that God would tell us, I still have people here in this city who, who are my people, right? Um, but the thing that really struck me this time as I was reading through it, right? Every, different times, different things just reach off the page at us, is God's words to Paul, do not be afraid. So if God is telling Paul, do not be afraid, what does that mean? Paul was afraid, right? There was a reason. There was something that was going on that, that's not recorded in this very brief history. It's 17 verses for 18 months, right? So the wholeness of what all happened to Paul in Corinth is not detailed. But just the fact, you know, like Sarah was saying, there, there obviously was something that was going on that caused Paul, who we often see painted as, as very bold and willing to go to great extents, that God had to reassure Paul, do not be afraid, but continue on teaching, continue on preaching, right? I have many people in this city uh, who are mine, right? I just thought that was interesting. That, that really reached out and, and grabbed me. This time, read that text I don't know how many times, uh, but that's what reached off the page and, and grabbed me this time. The Lord knew Paul's heart, that, and that was, uh, he was fearful or discouraged or perhaps Maybe even thinking about leaving. All right, it's time to move on. But the text tells us that Paul stayed in Corinth in total for 18 months teaching the word of God. And so with that, we get to the text of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to pick up in our actual study of the text in chapter 6, verse 1. What we're going to do is we're going to set the, set the scene leading up to the scripture that we're going to be talking about in our sermon this morning. So we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 uh, here in, in Bible class. So verse 3, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So let's think about a couple of things. Does he dare? The words that are translated, does he dare? This is a very strong wording from Paul, right? He is simply shocked we might say that christians are taking other christians to the public court that's what's being talked about so from a, a historical context you remember the agora that we saw in those slides right this large marketplace that was there in corinth and you can imagine in a place where there are folks coming from the north and there are folks coming from the south and they've got all these goods 
that Corinth had a large marketplace. And so in the middle of that agora, in the middle of that marketplace, would be the Bema seat, the place of judgment, right? And so as these folks took each other to court, it would have happened right in the middle of the marketplace. And in that Greco-Roman culture, these lawsuits, these legal disputes that were aired right there in the middle of the, of the marketplace were entertainment. Not much has changed, right? We still have, you know, uh, you know, whether you want to call it or not, uh, court or not, you know, we have Judge Judy and all these other shows, right, that are like pseudo court. But then you actually have like court TV that shows real trials. And then you have different trials that really capture the uh, attention of the country, usually murder trials. Um, and, and, you know, like people will be completely fixated and fascinated on like these, these murder trials that, that have no connection to them. Right. So nothing's new. Right? It's what they did then, it's still what we do uh, today as a, as a culture. Right? And so Paul is asking, why? Why, Christians, would you drag the name of Christ? Why would you drag the church in there to handle your disputes when, when as he's going to say, you should be able to handle these things among yourselves, right? among, among the brethren? And so um, that's where he starts here in chapter 6. Let's read verses 2 through 6, and then we'll give you an opportunity to give some input. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases, right? By comparison, trivial cases. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? We'll talk about that more in a minute. How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, it's cases between two Christians, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Okay. So... I guess I, I, I will wait a second. Let me kind of explain a few things, then we'll, we'll look for some input, okay? So an obvious area of interest in this passage is going to be verse 3, uh, right, where, he, where Paul gives us this interesting insight. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Just kind of throws that in there, right? We're like, What? Um, so reading through various commentaries and books about this section of, of 1 Corinthians 6, Paul has basically dropped a, a nugget of you know, insider knowledge, you know, knowledge that Paul had that we don't have any other context for, right? Um, it is fascinating to imagine what other things had been revealed to Paul, right? What else? did he know that he didn't write about that he had been shown right uh, or you know maybe the other apostles uh, you know had, had heard or the prophets from the old testament that we don't know about but but we'll know when we're in heaven right the idea of christians judging angels is a fascinating one it does not mean we will sit in the judgment of faithful angels but in some way we reign with Christ, we will have a part in judging the unfaithful. I, I couldn't tell you what exactly this means, other than when you read the commentaries, uh, it, is, it is just uh, like, everybody's just kind of like, what? <laughs> That's the, the general conclusion from that. Sarah, have you ever thought about this, or anyone else? Have you ever thought about this? It's an interesting aside. Yeah, you can, you know, I, that's the same way I approach things like this. Like, well, that's, that sure is interesting. That's intriguing. But I don't want to chase that rabbit too far down the trail because obviously it doesn't apply to me in salvation. Yeah, and, and when you can't know something, right. you just have to leave it. Right. There. It's just a, just a teaser, a foretaste of things to come. There you go. Um, so... If Christians are being prepared right now for such a glorious destiny, 
Why do the Christians in Corinth allow those who have no standing in the church to decide dispute among Christians? So you can see why Paul brought it up. I, maybe he even talked about it with them. I don't, who knows? Um, but, um, but we don't have any further context. So just like uh, Sarah said, we don't, we don't chase that rabbit too far down the trail. Uh, it is obvious from the context, though, that this must have been a, a quarrel rooted in some sort of uh, spiritual issue. Uh, we see in other texts that worldly judges wanted no part uh, in these quarrels about faith-related matters uh, between the, the Jews or, or the, the Christians. We've seen that many uh, a time. What other observations do you have from these first six verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Sarah? Okay. Okay. I'm not one of those people, but yeah, okay. Tell me more. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the Gibsons and the Howards. Then something, and I don't remember exactly what, what it was. Oh, in the Coliseum at, or a basketball Coliseum at ABU, the different Coliseums. Oh, okay. So they have a Coliseum named after them. Yeah. But something happened between the two in a business sense. Oh, yeah. And, whew, that took it to court. Yeah. Sure. And I just, I just got to where I, I wouldn't shop at any store. I yeah. But, and, and so you have people in your family who are not Christians, and they are mad at each other. Right. Uh, yeah. But that was, that probably, probably at least, oh, my goodness, that was probably 55 years ago. Okay. I'm trying to think about it. Sure. So, but even, even, even if it was 55 years ago, you still remember very vividly here was this incident just like what we're talking about that happened in a very public setting, yeah. right? And it was over a business dealing, yeah. right? And the was, uh, Jewish and, uh, sure, and that was before the internet. Yes. Okay, all right. And then uh, on another note, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. My grandfather tried to make peace between the sure. two groups. He, he didn't want the women trying to make peace. Right. And so people, preachers got up over the radio and on this side and shot arrows at him. They didn't call his name, but everybody knew who they were talking about. Sure. And the people on this side got up, you know, and they shot arrows at him. So he was the target in the middle. And I was too young to know. Sure. Yeah. And I said, Granddaddy, why didn't you get out there and defend yourself? Sure. And he quoted to me that scripture, brother goes to law against brother, and that's the land of Egypt. Right. Because, you know, no. Yeah. I, I don't want the church to suffer. Sure. And, and sometimes we need to remember the church does not belong to you, it belongs to Christ. Right. Yeah. Right. My, my Not me. Yeah. And I want to be right or I want to be involved in this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, it was good. A couple of examples, you know, one from, you know, from your family, from watching your grandfather. And even as a teenager, you, you know, you learned a valuable lesson. And then, of course, the other, a very public one that other people may have been aware of um, uh, from that same text. We realize that this is something that, that applies uh, you know, still, still today. The same, same lesson, same mistake can be made. So, 
Okay, so if you want the if you want the third part, Sarah Sarah will tell you. Um, oh yeah, yeah. They, they, no secrets in a small town, right? Um, so uh, I have in my notes First Corinthians one verses eighteen through thirty one. We're not going to do that. We don't have time. But you can go back and read First Corinthians one verses eighteen through thirty one on your own if you want to, uh, because it, it gives a little bit more context. Uh, of, of where the Corinthians are coming from that leads up to chapter 6. But we're just going to kind of continue on. So Paul has made it clear uh, in his life, right, that he is not um, against, he's not opposed um, appealing to the government, right? We're going to see that in his life, right, where he appeals to Caesar, and he uses his Roman citizenship to his advantage um, while he's detained. But it's also clear from Paul's writing that the teaching of, and the teaching of Jesus uh, that, that we are you know, to respect law, respect government, but also uh, be aware of, of how we uh, conduct ourselves in, in public. Sarah? No, you're good. Sure. Yeah, why, not, why not? Isn't it better that I take a loss or blow the my ego or blow the whatever? Sure. That's my business than to have the name of Christ messed up, you know. So for those who are online, for those maybe in the back of the auditorium might not be able to hear Sarah, so she said that, that you know her grandfather and some of these dealings that, that he had with folks when he was trying to make peace, folks attacking him from both sides, uh, in addition to uh, you know using uh, 1 Corinthians 6.6, 6, he would also include 1 Corinthians uh, 6, seven. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defrauded uh, even your own brothers, right? So going with that idea of, of you know, turning the other cheek, um, of, of, you know, suffering um, for self instead of allowing the, the church in the name of Christ to suffer. And so we, we see that in that, that same, same text. Appreciate you bringing that out. Um, yeah, that may actually be, uh, since we're not going to look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 31, that actually gets us right to the end of time uh, for class. And that kind of gets us where we need to be. It's a good stopping place. So I think we'll go ahead and cut off class there. Uh, we beat Claire down the stairs. So good. We're not running long. Um, but uh, appreciate your uh, participation in class today. Appreciate you being here. And we'll, uh, we'll get ready for worship here together.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our worship morning this Sunday morning. Happy Easter to each and every one of you and to your loved ones. Uh, it is certainly good to see each and every one of your faces here uh, this morning. So glad to see all of our regular members' faces here uh, on this Easter Sunday. Uh, I hope you all had a fantastic week. Um, good to see all of our any visitors that we have here this morning. Uh, we're, I know people are still coming in. We're going to go ahead and let you guys get settled and, and uh, sat down with your families and your loved ones. Uh, but again, we are so, certainly glad and excited to be worshiping with each and every one of you. Uh, here this morning. Glad all of our members who are here and able to be with us uh, in the flesh this morning. Also, uh, would like to uh, say good morning to each and every member and visitor that we have uh, checked in with us online. Um, this morning, we are going to, uh, Brother John McKenzie is going to uh, have our message for us this Easter Sunday. Uh, hymns are going to be brought to us by Daniel. Um, and if I can ask all of you to please fill out a, um, a membership card, leave that off to the side, and we will have some young gentlemen swing by after worship and pick that up. Uh, and what that does, that just gives the church a count of who all uh, was here this morning. Uh, if I could also ask any visitors that are here this morning, uh, please fill that visitor's card out, leave that to the side. Uh, that'll give us a chance to um, shake your hand at the end of service and uh, get to know your name and get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, so at this time, let us put everything aside. Let us clear our minds, clear our hearts, and let us get ready to sing, praise God's name together, and worship together. Good morning. If you're using the songbook this morning, we'll start with number 732, 732, and we will sing the first, second, and last verse of this song. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again.
sing and pray and take the Lord's Supper and give as well as listen and learn that we are praising and worshiping you. We are thankful for this opportunity on the first day of the week, every first day of the week, to assemble as your people, as your family, as your kingdom, as your church. And we're thankful for the congregation here at Bridgewood, thankful for the uh, ability to gather as, uh, as your people, and thankful, Heavenly Father, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that each one of us, as we participate uh, in the worship, know that you are with us as you have promised when we worship you. We are thankful for this occasion. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for those who may be visiting here today. We're thankful for each and every member, young and old, alike. And we know that in serving you, there is a work, a ministry that we all can do. That there is the one talent man is as important as that with more. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for those who participate in uh, worship, for Daniel leading singing, for those who make announcements and do what might be sometimes considered the menial but very significant uh, aspects regarding the Lord's Supper and then other uh, greetings and so forth. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the elders here who scripturally lead uh, this body under the chief shepherd, Jesus. We are uh, thankful for those who teach and uh, those who teach at every level. Thankful for John and for his uh, work uh, outside during the week and also for his preparation and lesson today. We're uh, thankful, Heavenly Father, for the country in which we live and need to always remember the blessings that we have and pray that you, we would, you would be with those who govern, that you would be with uh, those who are considered first responders, firemen and police and, and uh, doctors. And we're thankful, Heavenly Father, for all those who serve in this country in many different ways thankful for our military. We, Heavenly Father, uh, it's at this time that we want to uh, uh, sincerely and uh, with great attentiveness uh, participate in this worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. Next song will be number 274. 274, and we'll sing the first and last verse of this song. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's a parent's of 10,000 to my soul.
This morning we'll be reading uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Thanks, Sam. Well, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. We have a nice number of visitors with us, and we are glad that you are with us this morning, too. We want you to know that uh, we are happy that you're here to worship with us, and this is also a great Sunday to be here because it's a fifth Sunday, and we have a potluck luncheon prepared after worship. We know a lot of folks might have plans with their families for uh, an Easter lunch or something like that, but if you don't have plans, we would love for you to stay and join us. We always let our visitors go right to the front of the line right here at these double doors after our worship service. But even if you don't stay for lunch, we hope you'll stick around long enough so that we get an opportunity to greet you properly and, and to, uh, to welcome you with the love of God. We, uh, we always start off, or I start off, uh, each of our sermons with something encouraging. This morning, it's, it's a little bit more sobering, and, and what we have to talk about is kind of an update from uh, something that we did earlier in the year. There's going to be a photo popping up here in a minute of going out to take the point-in-time count, the pit count, with the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, TCHC. Lots of acronyms in there. So pit count with TCHC. We did this back in January. So you can see there that, uh, that Nolan and Booker and then Colin from the East uh, Point Church of Christ down the road, um, we all went out and we participated in this along with hundreds of other volunteers. So you'll also see there our neighborhood police officer, our NPO officer, Roger Marsh, a fantastic uh, person. And uh, so we had the opportunity to go out that night on his beat, beat five, where the church building is in this neighborhood, and to go out with the, um, with the purpose of visiting with anyone who was unsheltered, sleeping outside that night. And so that night we visited with, with five people. So fast forward to this week, and we had the TCHC, Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, State of the Homeless Address. And so it was over here at Texas Wesleyan, and so it's an opportunity to report the findings from that point-in-time count from Tarrant County and Parker County, and all for TCHC to talk about what they've been doing in the last year. Um, so I was in attendance representing the church. Um, I believe it's important for the church to be active and out in our community, especially in facing some of the challenges like homelessness. And so Mayor Parker, as she's done for the last year or two, uh, started off with some comments she had a script that had been prepared for her. She set that to the side and just gave some personal remarks. She started off by saying that her faith in God is what motivates her to find solutions for those who are sleeping unsheltered. For families that are sleeping, that are homeless, sleeping outside, sleeping in cars, and that there are other policymakers on the council that have that same heart as she does. Have you ever heard uh, Mayor Parker talk about homelessness and talk about people who are struggling with addiction? It's really something to hear. She's talked about it a couple times that I've, I've heard, but she speaks from personal experience. She was talking at this event about um, how her dad uh, struggled as an alcoholic for many years when she was a child. Finally, finding sobriety as she got into her high school years. And then he, he took that change that direction in life and headed towards helping others so there in Nashville where they were living at the time and where she was going to college he was ministering to those who were homeless and would go and check in with these folks who were battling addiction just like he had and other circumstances that might find them homeless and so he invited his daughter Maddie Parker to come along she admitted as she was giving these remarks this week that at times when she was young, when she was in college, she would grow impatient. She didn't understand why uh, her dad spent time with these folks and what, what this accomplished. But she said, now I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for that perspective because it's, it's really easy to, to lose focus, to lose track of, 
of folks who are dealing with addiction just like her dad did. But as we're, we're working with folks who are unsheltered, with folks who are homeless, to realize that's someone's father. That's someone's mother, that's their brother, that's their sister, that's a, a son, that's a daughter, that's a nephew, that's a cousin. When we really think about it, each, each one of us have someone in our lives who's been touched by addiction and who's been touched probably by homelessness. And so we keep that in perspective as we continue to minister in our community, outside of the walls of this building. Some statistics from that research are in connections for you to uh, look at. There's a, a QR code, or if you're on the online version, there's a direct link that you can click to read the 60 pages or whatever it is of the report. It's really pretty interesting. But a high-level summary uh, from the pit count that was taken earlier this year, uh, homelessness as a whole is down about 12% in Tarrant County. We have about, on any given night, in Tarrant County and also in Parker County, about 2,400 people who are homeless. Now, among the veteran population, that has decreased in the last year by about 14% because of some of the efforts that are happening from the VA and other nonprofit uh, groups. But the largest decrease, as you can see there on that, just some of those fast facts, if you can read that little print, is uh, 33%. A 33% decrease in homelessness among families. I remember from going to this meeting last year, they were talking about something new that had happened and all the, the changes and upheaval in the rental market, multi-generational homelessness. Folks had moved in together to try and, and, and make a go of it, to try and keep a, a roof over their head. And then when they no longer could, multiple generations of the same family becoming homeless. And that was something new. By comparison, uh, about 2,400 or so uh, homeless folks here in Tarrant County, about 4,500 4, any given night in Dallas County next door. Um, higher numbers also in the other major cities here in Texas. And of course, something like New York City, 88,000 homeless people on any given night. But we continue on, we continue uh, helping where we can, uh, reaching out, and we never give up on the idea that people can change. And that's where we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians today. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians in our overview of, of the New Testament as we're spending about two weeks in each book uh, of the New Testament thinking about some background on this letter from Paul to the Christians in Corinth. We talked about it uh, with some detail in Bible class this morning. Corinth is on this narrow isthmus of land, and it's a, a route for trade to go through. About a four-mile strip of land is where Corinth is located. On a, on a plateau above Corinth, there was a temple to the goddess of love, Aphrodite, overlooking the city. And so that sets the context for where Paul is ministering, a place with people from all over the world with a, a temple to, to the goddess Aphrodite up above and all sorts of things that were associated with that in the city. Paul, who was trained uh, not only in, in academia and, and philosophy and, of course, what we call the Old Testament— was also taught to be a tent maker. Every Jewish male had a trade, and so his was a tent maker or making things out of canvas. And so he found Aquila and Priscilla when he came into uh, Corinth and worked in the Agora, worked in the marketplace, and met many people doing that. Paul wound up staying in Corinth for 18 months. We talked about this morning in Bible class that there was a time, obviously, as we see recorded in Acts, which records the events that happened when Paul was first in Corinth. There was a time where, obviously, Paul had become disheartened or maybe fearful because God had to come to him and had to say, do not fear, for I still have people who are mine in this city. And so Paul ministered there for 18 months before moving on, about the longest he stayed anywhere. And the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
had great power on the lives of the people in Corinth. And so then Paul writes this letter, 1 Corinthians, and he writes it to uh, folks who have encountered some struggle, to a church that's encountered some struggle. But before we get to our text today, I want to look at what caused these people to change. When we see that uh, there in verse 11, that it was the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What exactly does that mean? And so we have to turn back to the Gospel of John to see what that means. Turn with me to, to John chapter 20. The Gospel of John chapter 20, let's set in our minds the, the power of the Gospel that changed the people in Corinth and changes you and me today, too. So, of course, uh, John, the the last of the Gospels that was written, uh, most likely written when John was uh, older in life, looking back on all the events that had happened when he walked with Jesus. So in John chapter 18, we see that that Jesus is is arrested and that there's a, a trial In John chapter 19, we see that he is beaten, he is scourged, he's crucified, he dies, and he is buried in a tomb. And that gets us to where we want to be in John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So you see throughout the Gospel of John, you'll see this literary device, kind of the way they they typically didn't refer to themselves. So the other disciple here, in addition to Peter, is John, the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, John is referring to himself here. So Mary, Mary Magdalene goes, she sees that the stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb that had been sealed, that had guards sitting on it, was now sitting open. The guards were nowhere to be seen. And so she ran to tell someone great urgency that we see there she tells peter and john let's keep reading so peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb both of them were running together but the other disciple outran peter and reached the tomb first so let's say john is probably in his 90s At the time where these events are are happening, he's probably in his 20s. He's probably 10, maybe even 20 years younger than Peter. John records different little details, little nuggets in his gospel that set the scene of of where he was. And this is one of those. I just find it kind of entertaining that he's saying, Peter and I were running to the tomb, and I beat Peter there. And he doesn't mention it just once. He actually mentions it a couple of times. But... We still see this setting here that there is great urgency, right? Even though they know that Jesus is dead, they they still want to know what's happened. Remember that Mary, the only thing that she can think of is that someone has taken his body and we don't know where it is. That's the only thing that she can possibly conceive in her mind that could have happened. And Peter and John are probably right there along with her. Verse 5, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths, that's John, saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Set the scene in your mind, the tomb, right? Got kind of a picture of what it might have looked like there. But a tomb, the door probably being maybe about five foot, maybe about four foot tall, carved into the rock. Quite often in these tombs, the different examples that we have today of tombs that might be similar to it, there was a kind of a weeping room, and then there was another smaller room with a platform or two where the body would have been laid. We've all heard the description of the preparation of the body of Jesus, wrapped in cloths with all sorts of different things to, to help in that process of the body breaking down, and then this cloth 
placed over his face. So that is what John has stooped in to see, but he hasn't gone in to see yet. We pick back up in verse 6. Then Simon Peter came, following him. Again, John just kind of working that in there. And went into the tomb. Peter saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Think about the, the chaos, the dismay that they were in, seeing Jesus die on the cross, then placing his body in the tomb, then rolling the rock in place and than going to mourn. Until that point, until John says, as the author of this gospel, that he saw and believed. Until that point, they did not understand what Jesus had been talking about all this time in their presence. As John recounts these things, it is at that moment that he sees he understands, and he believes. And it's from that point where we want to make our first application to ourselves from this gospel message this morning. In this description, we have Mary Magdalene who sees the tomb open. We have Peter who sees the linen cloths and the face covering of Jesus. And we have John, who sees and records that he believes at that point. What's interesting is that in each of those verses, in each of those contexts, there's a different word used for the word that's translated as see. So you can see up on the screen there that when Mary Magdalene sees, the word that's used there is blepo. And the, the uh, general idea is she perceived that the tomb was found open. Just like I can perceive that you are here today, she looked and the tomb was open. She perceived and it moved her to action. She ran to get help. Now Peter, who kind of fitting with his personality, runs up and goes immediately in. Right? John had hesitated and looked from outside. Peter runs in and he sees the linen cloths, he sees the face covering that was folded neatly and set to the side. And the word there is thoreo. Right? So he beholds, he beheld. And so he's trying to comprehend what's going on. But then there's a different word. There are actually you know, two different times that, that John saw, right? And it's kind of interesting to look at the two different words. The first time when John is just stooping in and looking at what's in the tomb, the same word blepo is used when he sees the linen from outside the tomb. But then when it says that he saw and believed, the word that's used there is, is ido, to know. He saw and he knew that Jesus had risen. He hadn't been taken. Nothing else had happened. He saw, he knew, he understood. This is all true. This is the gospel. So we apply that to ourselves this morning. Right? When we're reading through this text, we've, we've seen it before. And we could do the same as Mary with Bleppo, and we could perceive it, and we could read it and be like, that's nice. What's for lunch? We also might see this, the gospel account for us that has the power to save, and we might be like Peter, 
where we behold it and it starts stirring within us something that we need to know, something that we need to, to change, some kind of grasping, but it hasn't quite worked itself out yet. Or we might be like John as he records himself when he stepped into the tomb, when he saw the cloths, when he saw the face covering, and he knew. For many of us in this room, there has been a time where we read through the gospel, where we read through the teachings of the apostles, and in our mind, we knew something has to change. The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ worked to bring about a change. But for others, that time might not have come yet. But it's my prayer and the prayer of many in this room that that time is near for you. Perhaps even today, as we're reading through the gospel, you'll, you'll see, I need to change. And so we flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to see the gospel in action. As we head towards 1 Corinthians 6, our end goal for this lesson, we stop in 1 Corinthians 1 to gain a little bit more perspective on in Corinth. Right, in 1 Corinthians 1, you have Paul with the introduction to, uh, to the lesson, or to the to letter, and picking up in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 1, we read this. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you have any familiarity with the, the text of 1 Corinthians, you know that, that Paul is about to address some difficult things that are going on among the church in Corinth. There's division that's talked about in chapter 3. There's um, open, open sin that's occurring in, in chapter 5 that, that's like it won't even be named among the pagans what's going on up there in the temple of Aphrodite they won't even do what's going on and being allowed to exist within the church even in chapter 6 where we're, we're heading you know, they're, they're suing each other in the marketplace in the open court there and, and bringing shame to the name of Christ and, and to the church but before Paul gets to all those things in these first 10 verses Notice how thankful Paul is for the Christians in Corinth and for Jesus who made the difference in their life. If you've never noticed before, in the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians 1, Jesus is in every verse. I would even encourage you to underline the reference to Jesus in each of those first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians. Paul, in his letter, directing the Christians in Corinth, many who are straying, many who are struggling, some who are causing problems, back to Christ. Back to the gospel. Back to their first love. But then he addresses the difficulties. He addresses the division. He addresses the sin that was allowed to exist. And in chapter 6, as I mentioned, the lawsuits that were happening right there. And so that gets us to verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't let anyone delude you. 
Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor the men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's where we really want to pay attention. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Remember the context. Temple of Aphrodite on the hill overlooking the city of Corinth. All the different things that were going on in the city. And Paul lists a handful of them here. And then he reminds them, after correcting some of the, the misbehavior that we see uh, throughout the letter in chapters 3 and 5 and 6, right? After correcting these things, you are a changed people. You are a changed people because of the gospel of Jesus. You are a changed people because Jesus died on the cross. You are no longer conformed to this world, but you have been changed. Such were some of you. And then he gives us our final three words that we're going to consider this morning as we look at ourselves. Washed sanctified and justified. Paul was well qualified to talk about being washed. Right? When we go back into Acts chapter 22, we see Paul giving his account of the events that happened when he had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Remember that that Paul, then known as Saul, was persecuting those who were of the way. He was persecuting Christians to the, to the death even. And on the road to Damascus, he was struck blind by Jesus, had that encounter with Jesus, and he was told to go and wait. Then a man named Ananias was, was sent to him, and, and he regained his sight. And the first thing that we see recorded in Acts 22, verse 16, that Saul was told to do he was asked a question why do you delay arise and be baptized washing away your sins Saul who had had a direct encounter with Jesus who had been blinded so that he could see the light who was, uh, had his sight restored the first thing that he was told to do don't delay any longer. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. So Paul takes that from his own experience, from that encounter with Jesus, and he brings it over to the Corinthians. And he reminds them, you were washed, just as I was. The Christians in Corinth were baptized. They were united with Christ in a death like his so that they could be raised in a resurrection like his so they could know the glory of an empty tomb. But they weren't just washed. What's the text also tell us? That he was, they were sanctified. You can mark down Hebrews 10.10 10 if you wanted to have a reference in there about sanctification, but we know that Christians, when, when we are, are faithful to what God teaches about salvation, when we are, are baptized, when we are added to the number of the saved by the Lord, when we die to ourselves, we are raised new for something new and better. We are sanctified, we are set apart. And we continue walking in those good works that have been prepared for each one of us. And we continue on with the continual cleansing of the blood of Christ as long as we are walking in faithfulness and repentance. So the Christians in Corinth were washed, they were sanctified, and they were justified. We read in Romans 3, uh, verses 23 and 24. Romans 3, verse 23, that all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. But, verse 24, 
being justified by the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Corinthians knew that. Paul knew that. Many of you in this room know that this morning that you have been justified just as if I had never sinned. And you know the hope that is there. When we talk about a change, we talk about this, this powerful phrase that, that, that Paul uses to remind these Christians of who they were that also gives the hope to those who are outside of Christ. And such were some of you. We can sometimes become frustrated waiting on others to change. Why can't they change? Why can't they see the light? What we learn from Paul what we learn from God, what we learn from Jesus, is to never give up hope. Such were some of you, but you are changed. And it's not something that we can do all our own. I can't be washed, I can't be sanctified, I can't be justified all on my own. I need the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus for that. And so today, you have seen the Word of God. You've opened it up, you've read it for yourself, and now the question is, what will you do with it? You've read of how it motivated the Christians in Corinth to action, and, and even as they fell away, Paul called them back with the same gospel message. Perhaps that's the change that needs to happen in your life. But we look at the example of Mary Magdalene. We look at the example of Peter. We look at the example of John. Will you just see and perceive and move on with life? Will you see and behold and think, I, I should do something about that? Or will this morning be the day where you see and know I need to be in Christ. I've seen what the Bible teaches about salvation. I want to be in Christ this morning. I want to know the power of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and that he reigns today. The choice is up to you. And the invitation, the Lord's invitation is for you. Will today be the day that you see and know or will you just keep going down the path that you're going down? The invitation is yours. If we can help you at all as a church, come forward as we stand and sing. In the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hark in the love.
Jesus celebrated a ceremonial final meal with his disciples. We call it the Last Supper. At the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and passed it to the disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of your sins. In the church, we celebrate this new covenant meal by breaking bread and drinking juice, together in remembrance of Christ. We call it, again, the Lord's Supper. This meal replaces the Jewish Passover. There is no longer any need to bring a lamb to the altar because Christ is the Lamb of God. Sacrifice once for all, who takes away the sin of the world. There is also no longer any need to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on doorposts, for by faith we receive the benefits of the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from sin. Christ is our Passover lamb. To him the patriarch and prophets pointed. He was the hope of our spiritual fathers and the content of the preaching of the apostles. Christ is, is the spotless lamb of God, the living bread that came down from heaven with his body and his blood. He fulfilled all the requirements of God's law, delivering us from the slavery and tyranny of sin and death forever. Would you all please bow your heads and go to prayer with me? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we first and foremost thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for your <clears throat> unconditional love, heavenly Father. We are so thankful for the love that you showed us for sending, sending your only son on this evil earth to die for our sins, Heavenly Father, and we know that we will never, never be able to pay you back for that. Heavenly Father, I just pray that we, as your children, we just be obedient to your will, Lord, and as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, we remember why uh, we take this bread, Heavenly Father. We do so in remembrance of you. Heavenly Father, we just pray that we... Uh, remember why we take this bread uh, is it a, a symbol of your body your beaten body heavenly father and we're so thankful for the sacrifice that you showed each and every one of your children we thank you we love you heavenly father amen
you pray with me? Dear Lord and Savior, we thank you for allowing us to come before you. Dear Lord, only by the covering of our sins by the blood of your Son. Dear Lord, we thank you for this sacrifice. Our minds are upon the Son of Man hanging on the cross, nailing our sins to the cross in his bloodshed poured out on the ground for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for our sins to be taken away. We thank you for your son's blood to be spilt on our behalf. Dear Lord, help us to never fail to recognize this. Help us to not fail to remember. And help us this moment as we partake of this cup, to understand that this is the cup of the new covenant regarding the sin, the, the, the blood poured out for our forgiveness. Dear Lord, we know that life is in the blood and your precious son gave everything for us. You gave everything for us. Help us to remember this in Jesus' name. Amen. day and thank you for the blessings that you give us and Lord thank you for this uh, opportunity for us to come here and worship you and Lord we take this time to give back a portion of the blessings that you give us and we just ask that we do it in a manner that is pleasing to you in Jesus name.
next song is actually not found in the book. It is on the paperless hymnal only. Uh, but we, if you've been here on Sunday nights, we know that uh, we've sung this one a few times. Um, uh, so if you don't know it, the verse does repeat itself a couple of times. You'll be able to catch on hopefully pretty quickly. Um, but I think mostly everyone's going to know it at this point. We've done it several times. Uh, we'll sing all the way through this and then be led in our closing prayer, our closing hymn, and then be dismissed with announcements of family concerns. <clears throat> You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even the burden there came from the side, such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent. pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to all make it here safely today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity of worship in your word. Thank you for uh, the lesson that uh, John had given us today, it was, or perceived for us today. It was really good. Thank you for the food that we're about to partake in today, uh, this afternoon. May you bless it to the nourishment of our body. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Our closing song will sing number 315, 315, I'll live in glory. And we'll sing the first and last verse. I'd like to stay here longer than men's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high Yeah. 
Good morning, Bridgewood. Happy Easter to each and every one of you and your loved ones. Uh, happy to uh, worship with all of you this morning. Uh, John, I want to thank you for that wonderful and encouraging uh, message. Uh, John, we're so thankful for all that you do, for not only for this uh, church, uh, but for this entire uh, community. We really appreciate it. Daniel, thank you for leading hymns. Uh, you always do a wonderful job, and we appreciate it as well. Okay, this morning we just have a few uh, new prayer requests and a couple of new uh, monthly uh, coming up, up events. Um, Elizabeth Smith requests prayers for her grandpa, um, Mike Bashaw, as he recovers from a fall. Um, we want to keep Elizabeth and her grandpa in our prayers. Uh, hopefully that nothing serious, uh, no br breaks or anything like that. But definitely want to keep uh, Mike Bashaw in your thoughts and in your prayers as well. Annette Jarvis is requesting prayers for her mom who is in rehab right now. So we just want to uh, continue to keep uh, Annette and her mother in, her, in our prayers and for a re speedy recovery. Uh, also, Charlene Nelson also requests our prayers. Uh, she wanted to be at worship uh, very badly today, but was not feeling well, uh, and I'm sure she has checked in online uh, and heard the wonderful message uh, from John. Also, we have a, um, a request from uh, Sister, Sister Dodd. Uh, many thanks to Will Smith, um, who came to my house and within a few minutes had fixed my fuse box so I could have heat in my bathroom again area. I really appreciate his quick correcting a problem and had for several days. Uh, and that is from uh, Sister Clada Dodd. Uh, Will, thank you. We appreciate it. Appreciate all that you do, putting your talent to use. Okay, for our monthly events that are coming up for the month of April, our annual service project with the Academy for Kids is coming up, and we could really use uh, your help. We will be putting together grocery bags that we'll be giving away at the pop-up. A, a list of the groceries will be, um, excuse me, we'll need is on the Welcome Center uh, directly in the back at the, at, at the foyer. Uh, you can also hand in cash for this project directly uh, to John. We have a potluck lunch today. Everyone is invited, all of your family as well. Uh, we hope that you all stay uh, for lunch and have a wonderful time. Uh, we ask that visitors and those who are, have mobility issues are invited directly to the front of the line here at the doors to the right. Uh, since it is Fifth Sunday, uh, we will have no 5 p.m. worship tonight. Uh, that is all of my uh, announcements for this morning. I hope you all have a wonderful Easter Sunday with your loved ones. Uh, you are dismissed.